I also would like to uh, thank and congratulate the organizers for this uh, conference and thanks for the invitation. Um, I'll switch to colloidal nanoparticles, um, which is the field that we work on in my lab, mostly on semiconductor nanoparticles, which are quite familiar, I believe, to most of the audience. And you see here a selection of the type of structures that can be synthesized using the colloidal approach. We have uh, spherical nanoparticles over there with the well-known uh, quantum confinement behavior manifesting a rainbow of colors. And uh, these are the ones who have actually um, led to already to applications, especially in the area of biotagging, owing to the advantageous photophysical and optical properties that they manifest. And also due to the fact that we can treat these kind of systems chemically on their surfaces almost as molecules. So it gives a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, manipulating the materials. Shape control is another very interesting aspect because it introduces the opportunity to study the evolution from a zero-dimensional quantum dot to a 1D nanowire. And moreover, the focus of the talk today will be the ability to combine uh, different disparate materials on the same nanostructure, forming, for example, gold-tipped cad sulfide nanorods as seen here. So um, the particular focus is on uh, the combination of metals and semiconductors, starting from uh, our work a few years ago. I've, I've been focusing a lot of attention on the opportunity of uh, constructing particles which have more than one material on, to, on them. In this case, you see the example of cadmium selenide nanorods with gold tips. And um, the uh, first aspect of these kind of materials is, first of all, a synthetic aspect and growth mechanisms uh, in which you need to combine two disparate materials together on the same nanostructure. So there, are, um, there is a lot to investigate in terms of the type of materials that can be combined together from the semiconductor and metal side and the type of growth mechanisms that might be achieved. Um, once these uh, um, hybrid nanostructures have been formed, uh, there are several things that uh, are, uh, w show promise with uh, looking at further properties. The first is to, in to imagine the uh, gold tips here or the metal tips as anchor points, anchor points both, both for electrical connections as well as for chemical connections, exploiting the selectivity of the gold tip towards specific chemistries. Last but not least are interesting um, synergistic properties that emerge from the unique combination of the two materials together, namely not just the contact provided by a metal along with the semiconductor feature of the body of the metal, but a property which is uh, a synergistic one and a new one just from this unique combination, and that is manifested especially in the opportunity to absorb light in the semiconductor, separate charge, and use these kind of nanoparticles for photocatalysis, which is what I will also describe. So um, I'll start with uh, a little bit on the synthesis. The early reaction that we have done is a simple one in which we take ready-made uh, cadmium selenide and cadmium sulfide nanorods with, and react them with gold, gold salt, using a room temperature reaction with uh, dodecylamine as a surfactant to stabilize the nanorods in a reducing agent, and uh, DDAB serving as um, uh, a way to actually place the gold salt into organic solvent. And um, this reaction yields the, the tip growth that you've seen, basically a selectivity to higher energy facets of the nanoparticle, in this case, the apexes of the, of, the, of the rod, or in the case of a tetrapod, which is a central structure out of which we have four rod arms at tetrahedral angles, you, you see that you can grow the gold tips on each and every one of these uh, uh, arms. In the cadmium sulfide case, we've also been able to expand the method. However, in this case, you will note that, uh, especially under exposure to ambient conditions, we see growth of uh, gold also on numerous positions on the rod body, basically on defect sites. Um, another interesting mechanism that we've noticed in our studies of these uh, reactions was uh, manifested in the ability to observe two to one-sided growth transition on the cadmium selenide gold nanorods. Um, if you increase the concentration of gold in the reaction, you start off at the early, very early time, you can still catch a, um, a situation in which you have large, two large gold tips. But in fact, if you wait just a little bit longer, you will see that most of, it, most of your sample is actually uh, cadmium selenide rods with gold only on one side. 
This is uh, the result of an intrarod, intrarod ripening effect, an electrochemical ripening process, in which the small, one small rod, uh, gold island is oxidized, dissolves into the solution. The charge is actually traversing, probably on the surface, to the other side, where we have reduction and growth of a single gold um, tip, a large gold tip. And uh, after this early ripening effect, you see that in solution, after eight hours, this is still showing um, the, the one-tipped, one-sided, gold-tipped cadmium selenide nanorod, which really shows that there is um, an intrarod uh, effect and not, and not ripening between the rods, which would have led to some rods without any tips and a few with very large tips. Um, another way to actually control the growth which is more recent from our work, is uh, by adding illumination to the reaction. And uh, this was uh, especially necessary in the case of cadmium sulfide, where the thermal growth route mostly has led to uh, the defect growth that I've noted earlier on. And in order to speed up the reaction so that we can achieve cleaner growth, we introduced um, above-gap light which actually generates electron hole pairs, which can be then used, the electrons can then be used for reduction of further gold. And what is seen here is that um, with the addition of light at high temperature at 40 C, you uh, actually can uh, achieve growth of a single gold tip on one side, so it's an anisotropic particle is achieved. Still, there is defect growth here. You will, now, um, if we reduce the temperature, so this uh, basically indicated that we have two growth mechanisms which are happening in parallel, a thermal route versus a light-induced route. We therefore decided to cool the reaction to lower temperature, zero C, in which case we can mostly suppress the defect growth, uh, while the, the laser-induced growth still yields quite a nice a gold tip on one side with a very clean body of the rod. These kind of samples, as you see, also manifest the presence of this single gold tip very clearly in the absorbance spectrum. This is the onset of the absorption of the cad sulfide nanorod, which is uh, somewhat confined because of the diameter. And um, when we actually uh, uh, illuminate, you see the addition of this plasmonic peak of the gold tip, which appears uh, to grow very nicely in this case. To further understand the mechanism here, we've uh, looked at the effect of surface ligands on the growth. Um, as I mentioned, the original reaction of this dodecalamine which uh, um, actually shows at zero degree C the ability to suppress the defect growth. Uh, if you go to a longer amir, amine, octadecalamine, even at room temperature, the defect growth will be suppressed. On the other hand, if we take a bulky tertiary amine, triactylamine, you see that we have defect growth even at low temperature and in some cases actually two-sided growth. Um, this is actually uh, consistent with an uh, earlier study of Wooster et al., in which looked at the effect of surface ligands of these type of nanoparticles, in this case it was spherical nanoparticles, um, on the emission properties. And uh, these uh, authors have seen an interesting behavior, which is uh, counter to what you would usually expect, namely, under cooling, for example, with octadecalamine on the surface, you see that the emission actually goes down. Usually when we cool, the non-radiative rates are actually suppressed, and you expect to see increased luminescence. But here, it's in this particular range, between 300 Kelvin to 280 Kelvin, there was a decrease. And um, this was ascribed by them to a phase transition of the alkyl chains on the surface of the nanorod, or the nanoparticle in this case, which at higher temperature actually have a more dynamical motion which allows them to actually more effectively passivate surface traps and hence uh, achieve higher emission. And when they're cooled down, they, they, become, they are in a frozen state, and therefore that yields to um, uh, exposure of some traps for emission and uh, reduction in the fluorescence. Now this is, as you see here, uh, dependent on the number of, of, of uh, carbon chains, of carbons on the chain, of the, on the, of the alkyl chain, where the transition temperature increases over the range uh, when you make the uh, alkyl chain longer. So now if we go back to our work and use this kind of uh, model, what basically happens is that with the longer amine, we are um, actually uh, able to block the surface from access to the gold precursor, and that is consistent with the fluorescence results, such that we can um, uh, suppress 
the defect growth even at uh, higher temperatures. The bulky uh, trioctylamine, which actually shows defect growth even at low temperature, is uh, um, due to steric considerations leaving a much more open surface area for reaction of the gold. What about the location of the gold tip? Um, so uh, when you look at uh, how um, shape control works in such a system of cadmium sulfide or cadmium selenide nanorods, these are hexagonal systems. And um, in these systems, you expose the 001 or 001 knots facet, which are the fast-growing facets with, with higher energy. And these are, these are actually the ones which are also reactive towards the gold growth. As you see, we do note uh, several cases. We, you can see straight on growth in one case. You can see growth at an angle as well. Um, this type of growth with light induced uh, reaction can be expanded to different types of cadmium sulfide based nanorods. Longer nanorods, as you see here, nanorods which have a seed inside, such as cadmium selenide with a cad sulfide shell in a rod type or zinc selenide with a cad sulfide shell as well. And in all these cases, we could identify um, the single uh, tip growth on one side. And um, these are also useful to further investigate where, where does the, tip, the gold tip grow um, in comparison with the location of the cadmium selenide seed. This allowed us to apply the method um, which was um, applied by Dr. Ina Popov at the uh, Unit for Nanocharacterization um, to follow where, what is the relative location of our gold tip versus the selenium or cadmium selenide seed. And as you see, we see a diversity of behaviors. This is an example where indeed the gold tip is far from the seed, which is what you might expect because that is the fastest growing facet. Um, it can be also slanted in an angle. You see um, this case of a slanted angle. Or it could also be close to the gold seed, but again at an angle. And basically, in all these cases, you could assign the growth to um, taking place on surface rich, uh, facets which are rich with sulfur, which is what you might expect for the reaction between gold and sulfur, which would be uh, the preferential interface when we grow gold on these cad sulfide nanorods. Um, if we look more closely at uh, trying to look at the interface between the gold and cad sulfide or cad selenide, we've identified that we do not have epitaxial growth in this case. Um, you can see that by measuring the relative angles of the 002 planes versus the 111 planes on the gold. And this is, for example, the case of gold cad sulfide. So the distribution of those angles is quite random the uh, outline distribution of uh, a large frequency at a uh, small angle is uh, related to, let's call it an artifact of orientation of the particle to allow for identifying the lattice fringes. Um, the fact that it's a non heteropotaxial growth is perhaps not surprising considering the very large lattice mismatch between gold 111 and cad sulfide 002 or cad selenide on the order of 30%. And also the requirement for significant lattice distortion of the gold to enable um, uh, this kind of epitaxial growth. However, we still think that the uh, interface between the gold and the cad selenide or cad sulfide is covalent and described to gold sulfur or gold selenide bonds. Um, a case which is um, epitaxial was also demonstrated in a collaboration with a group of Caterina Sulantica and Bruno Chaudray in France. We have uh, looked at cobalt growth on the tips of the cadmium selenide nanorods. This is a different reaction at higher temperature, at high temperatures. I will not go into the details. And in this case, the uh, work on the high-resolution TEM of RESPO has shown that uh, indeed the, the cobalt adopts an HCP phase, and this was assigned to, the, to allow for a possibility of potential growth in this particular system. So um, I've gone over a few of the growth mechanisms, not all of them, focusing mostly on surface growth and ripening, leading to tip growth or uh, one-sided growth. I've also mentioned that we can get this one-sided growth with illumination, at least for the cadmium sulfide case, and there are other growth mechanisms which I will not go into. Um, it, now I want to move into actually what we can do with these kind of systems in terms of demonstrating their properties. The first one is to uh, employ the gold tips for connectivity, first for chemical connectivity. In this work, we, uh, we use um, the specificity of the gold tips towards reaction with the disulfide, with biotin disulfide, in order to functionalize the gold tips only or preferentially. 
And uh, we can play with the ratio between the biotin disulfide and, and the dumbbells to achieve um, relative uh, higher percentage of dumbbells which have one biotin on their tip. And then adding avidin at the right ratio, you can actually form preferentially dimers. And you can see these dimers over here. There is uh, actually different angles because of the uh, uh, ligands that are binding here. The linkers that are binding are flexible. Um, another structure which uh, was seen in a uh, small quantity in this case was this interesting flower-like arrangement, which is ascribed to the fact that avidin is in fact a tetramer and therefore could allow for uh, binding of more than one nanorod uh, through the gold tips in, and uh, uh, resulting in these multiple linked uh, flower-like shapes. The other uh, attribute of these uh, anchor points is uh, the use of them for electrical connections. Um, the early studies that we've done uh, included bo using both conductance AFM over here or STM, work in collaboration with Oded Milo and his group, in which uh, you clearly can see in these uh, current imaging maps here and here the higher conductivity of the gold tips as compared to the body of the semiconductor. More recently, or since then, there has been a large effort both in my group and in Berkeley to actually connect nanorods to electrical circuits and show that the lateral conductance through the rod body is actually affected or uh, co controlled by the presence of the gold tips. Um, in, my, in my group, we've been working on uh, electron beam induced deposition of tungsten leads, mostly on nanorods without gold tips. And this was uh, wiring, which I will not go into, which has led to quite interesting results. Uh, but in Berkeley, they've actually compared um, the uh, uh, conductivity through uh, cadmium selenide without the gold tips versus the one with the gold tips. And uh, in this case, they've achieved a remarkable increase of five orders of magnitude in the conductance in the case where they had the gold tips on top. This was done by trapping experiments. So this really uh, opens an, a nice avenue in showing that uh, the gold tips are very good in providing good contact between the gold electrodes in this case and the nanorod. And uh, this allows to uh, achieve very dramatic increase in the conductance of the semiconductor part of the rod. Um, now, the... Uh, last aspect of the properties that I wish to dwell upon is related to uh, this early observation which has shown to us so far that in most of the cases, certainly in, mo in all the cases where we grow gold, for example, on these nanorods, we see a quenching of the fluorescence. That is true for gold cat selenide, gold cat sulfide. When you look at the band diagram over here, um, the uh, natural reason for such a quench is associated with uh, light-induced charge separation, namely the electron here would preferentially go from the conduction band of the cat selenide into the gold, which then would facilitate very rapid relaxation. Um, further evidence for light-induced charge separation was provided by an electrostatic force microscopy study carried out by my uh, student who now graduated, Ronnie Costi, in which you can actually extract uh, a topography image uh, along with a charge image. This is the charge image in dark. And when we illuminate the nanorods, we see significant increase of negative charging on each and every nanorod, each and every nanodumbbell. This is to be contrasted with the uh, positive charging, mild positive charging observed for the cadmium selenide itself or for the gold particles themselves on their own. Um, this was assigned to actually indicate uh, charging effect related to charge separation followed by charge transfer to the substrate. So we have some retention of charge on the nanodumbbells which is unique because of the semiconductor metal interface in these materials. And I do not have time to dwell into the details of uh, the work here. Now, um, the observation of charge separation, light-induced charge separation, it's metal semiconductor interfaces, has been achieved before, notably in uh, oxide semiconductors, zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. Titanium dioxide is the prototypical uh, photocatalyst, obviously. And um, um, you, you can see the different, different works which we've collected here. Um, the difference with our systems are, I would say, twofold. First, we have the opportunity to push 
the semiconductor well into the visible range in terms of its absorbance, which is a limitation in the oxide semiconductors, which are limited to UV absorbance, and hence are um, of limited utility when we talk about solar energy harvesting. Secondly, the degree of control that we have on the parameters of both the semiconductor and the metal deposition is uh, really very high as compared to the older works. Um, in fact, the holy grail of the field, I would say, would be to produce hydrogen via the photocatalytic water splitting, a problem that has been studied uh, since almost 35, over 35 years now, uh, and again, primarily by titanium dioxide as the semiconductor which absorbs the light and then facilitates both oxidation reaction of water or, and at the same time, reduction reaction to allow for evolution of hydrogen, which is, which is in, in principle a clean a fuel and a way to transform the solar energy into a chemical fuel. Where do we stand with this photocatalytic uh, demonstrations or studies? First, we started off with uh, using a uh, model dye, methylene blue, which upon acceptance of two electrons, reduction by two electrons is turning colorless, and we use the uh, uh, ethanol to serve as a whole acceptor. Generally, the nanodumbbell is irradiated, charge should be separated, allowing for reduction, and at the same time, a whole scavenger needs to take uh, away the whole. So for to this purpose, we can synthesize nanodumbbells also in water. Methylene blue and obviously water splitting are all in water. And uh, this is an experiment which uh, shows uh, some photocatalytic function. Uh, specifically, it's a pre-radiation experiment. Namely, we take a solution of the nanodumbbells. This is the absorbance of this methylene blue uh, at zero minutes. We mix it with a methylene blue. But before that, we actually irradiate the solution on its own right without oxygen inside. Um, and uh, after this uh, pre-radiation, we add the methylene blue, and at different times we see reduction of the methylene blue. You see that the reduction with the methylene blue uh, is, is faster as compared to what we see just for a mixture of gold and cadmium selenide nanoparticles which are not linked together chemically. This is basically uh, the evidence that nanodumbbells retain the electrons, they store the electrons, and then they can reduce methylene blue later. Uh, more recently, and these are preliminary results, we have set up the ability to do photocatalytic experiments of water splitting by irradiating a cuvette uh, with the nanodumbbells or other uh, photocatalysts inside, and then sampling the atmosphere here with a gas chromatography detector. Uh, we, at this point, can only do half of the reaction. Uh, namely, we can only reduce. We don't have the ability to oxidize. And uh, the whole acceptor are polysulfides, uh, to serve uh, as the balancing reaction for the uh, reduction of the, of the water. Um, the system that I'll show you is one in which we have cadmium sulfide reacted with palladium, what we denote as palladium X, which is the, the structure is uh, still under study, but it's probably palladium four sulfide. It's a high temperature reaction. You see that we can also here achieve uh, growth that starts from the tips, and uh, we can actually use these as photocatalysts you see the hydrogen peak uh, increasing, and uh, the evolution was translated into a yield of 2.8% uh, or so. Um, and what I view with this is the ability to actually tune the parameters and understand what are the different properties that actually affect the yield. This is what we will do or we are doing now. Um, in, in any event, the control experiments have clearly shown that it is just this combination of cad sulfide and palladium that uh, yields 3%, and uh, the uh, elements themselves, uh, cad sulfide or palladium nanoparticles themselves, have negligible yield in hydrogen evolution. So I've, I will uh, summarize and actually just leave you with the, uh, a thank you to the group and to the collaborations that, uh, of the people who have actually done what I've shown you today. Thank you. We have some time for two brief questions. Okay, okay if not, let's thank Professor Benin again. <laughs> and, uh, our next speaker is Professor Yuval Golan from Ben Gurion University. And he will tell us about uh, new insights on the synthesis.